Morena e te whanau and welcome to, it is indeed day 27, uh, Tuesday the 21st of April. Uh, you would have heard it announced yesterday um, as I think the whole country was waiting with bated breath. It's definitely um, the most kind of excitement and intrigue that I have seen following a political announcement in my lifetime. Uh, even though I operate in quite um, political circles and um, bubbles, for lack of a better term, um, even even the election isn't followed with as much bated breath as the announcement around alert levels were yesterday. Uh, Morena Jeanette and Morena Tracy and Caleb. Um, what we had announced yesterday is that on uh, Monday uh, midnight on the 27th, uh, that is on Anzac Day, on midnight, uh, you will see that uh, the Alert Level 4 lockdown is being lifted, uh, by which point in time we will go into, um, Morena Mike, by which point in time we will be going into Alert Level 3. We will stay in Alert Level 3 for at least a fortnight, after which Cabinet will evaluate the most recent round of research and data and evidence and make another assessment on where we will go from there. Whether it is that we potentially, um, you know, move up or move down, nothing can be taken for granted. Uh, Liam um, McConnell Whiting is asking about the webinar um, and asking if I can talk about that a little bit. Um, so this is exactly what I was kind of planning to do a real brief yarn on um, this morning, Morena Rebecca, uh, about with regard to uh, what I got up to last night. I um, had the good fortune of uh, getting onto a live stream um, kind of panel discussion, called it all hui. Uh, with my mate councillor Tamitha Paul, uh, who is one of the awesome uh, young elected members across the country and local government who are working for change at a grassroots level. Uh, and just, guys, I'm not sure if you have experienced live streams crashing um, or any of the kind of attempts to move particularly big organisations online at the moment and how it is really, really challenging. <laughs> at the best of times like it takes the uh, notion of technical difficulties with uh kind of powerpoints playing at um, a live presentation to a whole new level uh basically we broke the internet with around 500 people trying to um get into our online hui and we had to um, move the platform um, of all of these awesome speakers uh, into uh, the space of Zoom. I tried and trusted old school technology. Uh, we had to record that and then post it up on the Aotearoa Town Hall uh, Facebook page. I'll link that in the comments below um, if you want to catch up with it, Liam. Uh, we did unfortunately end up losing Kate Rayworth in that transition. Kate Rayworth being the Oxford economist who is the author of Donut Economics. Uh, but she did thankfully uh, stick around for the first little bit and we will have her again later down the track uh, but Kate is a fascinating mind who I've had the opportunity to um, actually interview previously um, in one of the many podcasts that I have uh, gathering dust at the moment which I've got to figure out um, when to um, kind of release <laughs> um, when I get around to it. Um, I've currently got an awesome um, local artist by the name of Phoebe working on um, an artwork which we'll release it with. Um, I've got a podcast there with the likes of um, Johan Hari who wrote Chasing the Scream uh, actually with Helen Clark on um, drug law reform and with Jane Goodall um, when she was over here um, helping to establish the Jane Goodall Foundation. So there is an awesome cachet of um, cool podcasts that will be coming your way and hopefully not um, completely redundant by the two years or so that it's taken me to get them off the ground. Uh, but Kate yesterday was asked um, just what was supposed to be a bit of a funny question um, by Tamitha about... Uh, given that uh, Kate envisions, you know, and provides the analogy or metaphor for the way that our economy should be operating as a donut, that being um, kind of the, the dough of the donut is the safe and just equitable space for humanity to exist in. Uh, if we go towards the middle of the donut, we're obviously would be overshooting uh, as into space or the floor that should exist by which nobody has below that level of rights, freedoms, dignity or otherwise. 
uh, and extending beyond um, those kind of limits at the top or on the outer um, edge, outer shell, on the donut doesn't really have an outer shell, uh, but on the outer edge is uh, planetary boundaries or limits. So as soon as we start overshooting there, it's the equivalent of uh, you know, ocean acidification, it's the equivalent of excessive carbon emissions, all of those things which ultimately are detrimental to and damaging to our planet. So Tam, just for sake of a fun question, asked Kate, you know, if we want to be working towards our economy being effectively a donut, that being redistributive, regenerative and otherwise, uh, what kind of format uh, is a good analogy or a good metaphor for our economy at the moment and what it can be? And what Kate came up with was a sourdough starter. Um, I actually... Oh, uh, I am the equivalent of everybody else right now um, in the, the kind of their bubbles of privilege uh, and that I have my own sourdough starter <laughs> because of course I do. Um, I absolutely um, I'm kind of... I originally thought that it was just this bougie thing that nobody would ever do, um, that, that nobody would ever be able to meaningfully get on board with. But guys, it's so simple. It's just water and flour. Um, anyway, so Kate said that right now what we have um, is kind of the analogy of a sourdough starter as an economy, that being it is regenerative, it is restorative, and oftentimes it's actually based on community sharing. Uh, that being that kind of the bug or the starter that she um, began her sourdough journey with was donated by uh, a neighbour of hers and kind of that community orientation and ability to continue to produce more and more things out of something which restores itself. Uh, and I also think um, that, you know, this is where it's really important to recognize that even stuff that can regenerate, even our renewable resources, ultimately need time, space, and energy uh, in order to restore and to renew. Um, I'm just getting notifications coming through now, actually, of something which I was going to post up about later, about how uh, during this coronavirus uh, situation, and the slowing down of people moving around the world and around their own countries uh, and kind of turning in, staying home and looking after um, their friends in Fano. Uh, we've experienced a crash in oil prices internationally, so it'll be interesting to see if that flows on to consumers. Uh, but what that means, I think, again, is that unless we are genuinely orienting uh, the economy to take into account the cost uh, of long-term exploitative practices like oil, you are always going to have these massive fluctuations and never going to have the meaningful lead time to invest in alternatives. Um, folks are asking about Rewana. Um, that, that is, of course, um, the, you know, the, the old school um, Māori uh, way of making bread. Um, look, I need to get schooled up and I will absolutely um, be saying that this is the very beginning of my baking journey. I'm not sure if you saw, but I had um, a pretty shocking attempt at bagels uh, yesterday. I definitely did not use the right yeast, but it was the only yeast that I could find uh, at the supermarket. Um, the other stuff that is really important to uh, kind of speak about um, that came out of the Kōrero last night uh, is around the notion that in this transition we have to be really cognizant of uh, folks who are going to be the most and the worst detrimentally impacted by uh, the loss of their jobs or otherwise. And again, I always refer return to that uh, statement by Secretary of Education, Iona Holstead, uh, that this pandemic did not create inequities, it simply exposed them. And it has created uh, even more of that potential divide and in inequality. And that is why we are now finally recognising the importance of doing things like living wage, having conversations around stuff like universal basic income. But we need to tie that fundamentally to stuff like tax law reform, because otherwise we are going to get out of this space, out of this headspace and this physical space of this lockdown and be oriented towards going back to business as usual. And we are not going to have one any long term changes. So this takes me to um, the kind of contribution by David Hall 
who is a wonderful academic that is well versed in um, actually a variety of different areas, whether it is trees or immigration. Um, David is also the author of uh, a book called The Careful Revolution. Um, and he's based out of Tamaki Makoto, Auckland. And um, it was really fascinating because my mate Marlon Drake, who actually is a living wage campaign organiser, I shared his piece um, that he wrote in Stuff on my page not too long ago. And Marlon was asking about, you know, why is it that when we're talking about revolution or change politically or structurally, that we have to talk about being careful? Is it simply about being polite? And David's response um, was, I think, really meaningful and really insightful in that, and I'm referring to my notes here, uh, you know, the, the notion that revolution per se, change evolution is always inevitable, uh, but the reality is that it can hurt. And he kind of referred to the um, common terminology that's cropped up, particularly in progressive circles, when it comes to trying to tie together issues of social and ecological justice, that being the just transition, the notion that nobody should be left behind when we move towards a renewable, regenerative green economy. But um, kind of echoed the sentiments of um, someone who he didn't name, uh, but a quote that he had latched onto recently that a just transition doesn't mean a slow transition. And in fact, the slower that we make the transition, the more painful that it ultimately is for everybody. So it's important to recognize that ultimately, this is all a problem fundamentally of design. And it brings me back to a point that we were um, all yarning about in one of these live streams not too long ago, uh, which is that inequality, you know, suppressed or low wages for low income earners, uh, the quality of housing that people are expected to live in or a lack of housing, the cost of housing, uh, mobility around the city being primarily dependent on cars, mobility between cities and towns being primarily dependent on cars. All of that stuff is by design. It is either intentional or it's by neglect that an alternative wasn't put forward. Which brings me to the point that all of this stuff is policy design. Inequality right now is fundamentally policy design, which can be really gutting when you realize that it's been the decisions of subsequent decision makers, subsequent people in politics that have ultimately eroded uh, the safety, the welfare, the well-being, and the support of the folks who most need it. Uh, but it also helps you to recognize that this stuff isn't natural. It isn't written in stone, it's not in concrete, and ultimately we can change it, which hopefully offers a silver lining and some form of uh, you know, space to operate in where we recognize the potential that is palpable for change. Uh, we also just had a few more um, bits and pieces. Um, there was an awesome contribution um, by Caro Dentis, uh, who is, I believe, as soon as we get out of lockdown, about to start working with um, Hutt City Council uh, comes from a planning background, that being kind of urban planning, uh, and does a kind of iwi consultation. And he was speaking to the fact that, you know, if we don't build our kind of collective tribes or our collective communities or groups in this space and continue to re-energize and recharge the kaupapa or the values that we want to take moving forward, we will be get caught in a web of inertia and ultimately be turned back in on each other to continue fighting each other. Um, and while we're all fighting each other, um, those who are profiting big time from the way that things are, um, are just continuing to profit and nothing's changing ultimately. Um, he also spoke about uh, how his preference in terminology isn't decolonize, it's not about returning back to a space that uh, can sometimes end up being um, you know, envisioned in some people's minds with rose-tinted lenses, but it's about um, re-indigeneity or re-indigenizing. Uh, so it's about taking the lessons of tikanga and te ao Māori and bringing them into uh, a space that pays credence to and respect to the past, but also integrates with contemporary practice. Um, and I just found that really beautiful. And as a Pakeha woman, um, Tangata Tiriti, uh, I, I definitely can't speak too much about that, um, but I would highly recommend um, tuning into that kōrero. Uh, you can find it on Aotearoa Town Hall's page. Uh, Dara is saying donor economics is a difficult name to market. 
I don't know. I don't know. I mean, you've got some people who are out there now talking about how level three is just um, a little level four with takeaways. So um, maybe there is some appetite for that kind of stuff. I think another kind of analogy for donor economics is uh, it's the equivalent, right, when people try and segregate the camps of social justice and ecological justice, uh, it's the equivalent of saying that you can't produce, um, you know, a loaf of bread, to continue with that analogy, uh, that is simultaneously not undercooked and not overcooked. But that's actually exactly what we're trying to do. It's two sides of the same coin. If we're looking to produce a just society, we want the loaf of bread not overcooked, that being not exceeding planetary boundaries, and not undercooked, that being having the resilience of strong communities that are all supported. We want the loaf of bread. Um, we've got uh, a few other folks. Nicola um, heard that quarter it all from Kate. I'm looking forward to watching the Hui on Zoom. Um, Nicola, there's also more um, to come from Kate, which will be awesome, and I will produce um, that podcast sooner rather than later. Um, uh, Brad is saying that, yeah, this is a warning to change. Absolutely. But I think we also need to recognise... Um, the hurt that has been done to a lot of people um, in, in this pause, um, you know, a lot of lives have been lost uh, and we can't, we can't take that um, lightly. And that's not to say at all, I'm not, I'm not putting words in your mouth there or trying to reread um, or rewrite rather what you've said, uh, but it is really important um, to recognise that uh, whilst COVID-19 is for many folks with privilege like myself, um, an opportunity to work from home and to have slightly more time to do things like create sourdough starters. Um, it is challenging a lot of people's livelihoods. Um, and again, this is all ultimately the space where we need to be working towards a better future. Um, Gek is asking about any chance of moving the national election style to STV. Oh, mate, I could speak forever about different election styles. Um, I personally would much prefer that. Uh, if we were talking about um, our electorate votes in particular, because um, right now we essentially have first past the post inside electorates, and it means that there is an unnecessary focus on narratives like splitting the vote as opposed to who is the best candidate. Um, I only have about two more minutes, guys, um, but I will be responding um, to all of the other um, comments that uh, you know chucked in here. Um, Gek is asking about how many metaphors I'm juggling. Mate, I've got all the metaphors. Um, I've got all the metaphors because what I've found, um, particularly in politics, you know, is that you can be there just screeching um, facts and evidence into the void, but if it's not accessible or understandable to people, then it's not worth the paper that it's written on. Um, so metaphors are a really useful way to try and communicate to folks um, what's going on and what you're trying to achieve. I also just want to shout out um, to, uh, I got a tweet last night from Amy Healy, um, who's a Green Councillor in Brighton, uh, Green Party Worldwide, uh, and it's to me demonstrating uh, that these yarns that we're having every morning aren't just limited to Aotearoa New Zealand, but they are resonating across the world, which is a really cool and exciting thing. Um, but with only about a week more um, in Alert Level 4, um, I'm really contemplating whether I continue um, doing these live streams. Uh, so if you've got any ideas um, to that effect, um, we've got at least a week more together. Um, but in the meantime, um, have a lovely Tuesday. Uh, remember to stay home uh, to save lives and to be kind, especially to yourselves. We'll catch you again tomorrow at 10 past 8. Kia ora.